and his love for us. So maybe you should put your sermons to music. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I didn't say you should sing them. <laughs> All right, please stand for the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> Today, David will be preaching on the nation of Israel is not God's people. If that doesn't come as a surprise to you. So I'll be reading Philippians 3, 1 through 11. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you is no trouble to me as it is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory of Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, <coughs> blameless. Who can say that? But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that, I, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Sorry. Father, we are blessed to be here. We are grateful to be able to come into your house, Lord, to worship, to be taught today that you would instruct us in your love for us, how you set us apart to be your people. May we listen with open ears and open hearts today, Father, to hear and understand and to learn and to live out what we learn today, Father. May we make it uh, not just hearers only, but people of action, people of you that love others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gary. You <clears throat> I'd like to say thanks for those of you that are in the music ministry, and it truly is a ministry. I was uh, blessed this morning. That song is just, it's so powerful, and you just focus on what, what is being said there. And uh, I guess our music ministry is so great because we have a fourth of the church in it. <laughs> that helps when you have that many people in the music ministry. Not many churches can say that, you know. <clears throat> But thanks, guys, all of you. I really, I do appreciate it. It's uh, truly a time of worship and a time of blessing. Okay, well, I think we'll get started. Good morning, Brians. Good morning. Appreciate you all being here today. Those watching online, thanks for joining us again. I want to start with a question this morning. Does eschatology matter? Well, hopefully, this war in Israel has helped you to see that your eschatology really does matter. Because if you hold to the preterist view of eschatology, the news of the war in Israel didn't make you think the end of the world was near, didn't make you think the tribulation's about to start, didn't make you think, you know, this is it, it's the end. You didn't see it as a fulfilling of prophecy because you know all prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70 with the destruction of the temple. Eschatology matters because the eschatology of preterism destroys the false doctrine of Zionism. Let me share a comment with you from last week's message that was posted on Rumble that is <laughs> it's kind of sad, it's kind of powerful. Commenting on the message, Jubilee 13 says, Amen, Amen, and Amen, plus five stars. Thank you, Pastor David, for teaching what the Bible has to say about Israel. I know in past sermons you have preached about the importance of belonging to a local church, 
But right now, I, can think of, I cannot think of a more dangerous and unwelcoming place to be. That is really sad, but it's true. Just listening to conservative Christian radio in the past week, I've been identified as a heretical Jew hater bound for hell because I don't wave the blue and white flag. Not exactly interested in checking out any local churches all hyped up on Jesus coming back just because nuts in, in office want a war. No thanks. I'll read my Bible and pray at home. I get it, Jubilee 13. I really do. I get it. Um, you know, I've talked to people this week that said I didn't go to my church this week because I knew what they were going to talk about. I stayed home and watched Berean. <laughs> the sad thing is, this is what's going on in the local churches, okay? It's just, you know, it's for those of us who understand the truth of Scripture, this is just heartrending. It's just, you know, it's sickening, but this is what's happening. I mean, they got the flags up on the pulpit, and they're wearing garb and whatever, and they're just, you know, all praising, you know, Judaism. And I think the bottom line here is our political leaders, they want a war. And Christians, for the most part, support them because they falsely believe that modern-day Israelites are the people of God. That, that's the problem. It's, it's bad theology. And Zionism is destructive. It's not just a bad theology. It's destructive. The social media gab, I keep telling you about it. You all need to, if you're not on gab, you need to go on gab. It's a free speech platform. It's the only free speech platform that there is today. And the nose on gab writes this. In America, you can deny Jesus as the Messiah and the existence of God without any repercussions. But you cannot deny the Holocaust or be an anti-Zionist without losing your job and bank account. It's no coincidence why America is going to hell in a handbasket. That is so true. Listen, you can say anything you want about Christ, anything about Christians as slanderous and blasphemy as you can get, and nobody cares. But you say something about Israel, and, uh, oh, you're going to be in trouble. Last week, Citibank fired one of its staffers because she posted on social media what they called a revolting commentary on Instagram. Here's what she said. She said, no wonder Hitler wanted to get rid of all of them. And so she gets fired. Now, I can understand her getting fired if her job was public relations for Israel, okay? But that's not her job, okay? She works at Citibank. What do they care? What do they care? Now, you know, she could have posted something like, you know, against Christ and say, no wonder the Jews killed him. Nobody would have cared. Nobody would have done a thing. But somehow, Israel is in the favored position right now, okay? James Perloff writes this. Christian Zionists have, brought, have bought into the myth that Israel is only defending its right to exist and that Palestinians are terrorists. The Israelis have over 4,000 tanks, over 400 combat aircraft, thanks to a steady flow of about $3 billion annually from American taxpayers. $3 billion. And they want more right now. The unarmed Palestinians have not one tank or one plane. They fight their illegal occupiers primarily with stones. Now let me say here, and I want to make this clear because it is very important, the Israeli people are not the problem, okay? Mossad is the problem, okay? The Ashkenazi Jews, the, the mafia that are inside Israel, they're the problem. Palestinians are not the problem. It's Hamas that's inside Gaza that's the problem. And please don't let the mainstream media cause you to hate the innocent people in these countries. It's just like us. Our government goes over and bombs Civilians, bombs people, people hate us. We don't want it either, just like they don't want it. They don't want this war. They don't want what's going on over there. It's the leaders that are the problem. So I'm not speaking out against the people. My heart breaks for the people that are being slaughtered. 
As we saw in our last study, those in Israel who call themselves Jews are those anywhere who call themselves Jews or Israelites are not Jews. They're not religious Jews. We'll talk about that in a second. They're not ethnic Jews. They have no connection with the ancient Israelites who were Yahweh's chosen people. There's no connection whatsoever. We have to understand that. I think most Christians today believe that what they call religious Jews today are adherents to the Tanakh, all right, the Old Testament. But those who call themselves Jews today follow the Talmud, not the Tanakh. And the rabbis consider the, the, the Talmud superior to the Tanakh. The Talmud was a collection of Jewish writings that the Jews came to hold more sacred than the Scripture. So these guys wrote these writings, and they said, well, these are, these are more important than the actual Bible itself, the actual Scripture. That happens today, doesn't it? People praising the creeds as higher and more important than the actual Bible itself. Same thing. And modern-day Jews are converts to Talmudic Judaism, and they have no spiritual, no ethnic connection with the people of Yahweh that He entered into covenant with at Sinai. None of the so-called Jews today are following the Mosaic Law. And that's what we think of. We think of Jews, we think of Israel. Well, they're people who follow the Mosaic Law, right? None of them. One of the very important ordinances of the Mosaic Law was the Sabbath, right? It's part of the Decalogue given to Israel. Exodus 20, 8 through 11 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh is a Sabbath to Yahweh, your God. On it you shall, do no, you shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." So we can see that the Sabbath was important. It's one of the commandments in the Decalogue. But to stress the importance of it, look at Exodus 31.14. You shall keep the Sabbath because it's holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. That gives you an idea of how serious the Sabbath is. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among the people. Now, let me ask you something. Those in Israel, or those anywhere, calling themselves Jews, calling themselves Israelis, do they keep the Sabbath? They don't keep the biblical Sabbath. They may keep ace. They may try. They have some semblance of what they're doing here. But I want you to notice what the Sabbath worship included. Numbers 28, 9, and 10. On the Sabbath day, two male lambs, a year old without blemish, and two tenths of an ephah of flour and a grain offering mixed with oil and its drink offering. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath, besides the regular burnt offering and the drink offerings. Every day, every day, Israel had to offer a lamb in the morning, a lamb in the evening. Every day on the Sabbath, they had to have two more lambs, okay? So this is part of the worship. When is the last time an Israelite sacrificed an animal? A.D. 70, okay, before that. When the temple was shut down, the priesthood was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, they have not sacrificed. They reinvented Judaism, they added a lot of things, and I saw some rabbis this week trying to defend what they call Judaism without sacrifice. They said, well, God told us to stop sacrificing. And then, man, they quoted some scripture totally out of context, and I just laughed. I'm like, you know, it's sad, you know, how they try to defend what they're doing. But people, <coughs> there are no religious Jews today, there's no ethnic Jews today. There's no followers of the Mosaic Law. Hence, there can't be a religious Jew. All right? And what we have to understand is that once Christ began His ministry, only those who believed in Him were children of God. Things changed when Christ came, okay? All the Jews who rejected Yeshua as Messiah, they were no longer the people of God. I mean, here you are, you're God's people, you're part of Israel, the Messiah comes, you waited for your whole life, and you reject Him, all of a sudden now, you're not, a, you're not part of the people of God anymore, because Messiah has arrived. 
Once Christ came bringing in the new covenant, only those people who had faith in him became children of God, became heirs of the Abrahamic covenant. Now let's look at what the New Testament has to say about who are the true people of God. This is a powerful statement that Paul makes here in Philippians. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, but it's safe for you. I got to tell you this again and again, okay? It's, it's better for you. Look out for dogs. Look out for evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God, glory in Christ Yeshua, and put no confidence in the flesh. <clears throat> Three times he says, look out. These are all in the imperative. They're commands. Be on the constant lookout for dogs, for evildoers, for the mutilators of the flesh. And Paul has one hostile group in mind here that he describes three different ways. Who are they? Well, if you compare the word mutilate in verse 2 to circumcision in verse 3, you'll notice that he's talking about Judaizers. All right. In the Greek here, you see his play on words. The words he uses, katatome and paratome, and the Judaizers, they're people who went around in the first century promoting Judaism. They're pushing Judaism on the believers. They're saying, in order to be a Christian, you must first come through the door of Judaism. You must be circumcised. You must keep the law. They were saying, sure, it's okay if you trust in Christ, but you have to keep the law. Now, these Judaizers can be put into two groups. Some of them are just Jews. They're not Christians, they're just pushing Judaism. But according to Acts 15.5, it says they called them Pharisees who believed. So they were believers. But they had not parted from the Mosaic system. The Judaizers didn't denounce Christ. They just said it wasn't enough. You got to add to it. They were teaching faith plus work system. Nothing's changed, right? Now, he says, continue to be looking out for dogs. This comes from the Greek word kuon. It means a dog, literally or figuratively. And Paul uses it figuratively here, the Judaizers. He calls them dogs. This is strong language. You didn't call people dogs in the ancient world. It's a derogatory term, much more then than it is now. I think it's still a derogatory term. You tell someone, you're a dog. You know, and when I was a teenager... If we thought a woman, a girl was ugly, we say, she's a dog, okay? Now, as derogatory as that is, it doesn't have near the strength it did in the first century, okay? Dogs in the ancient world, for the most part, they were not pets. They were regarded with contempt. They traveled in packs. They were scavengers. They carried disease. In the Bible, the dog always stands for that which nothing can be lower. So he calls them dogs. He also says, continue to be looking out for evildoers. Evil here is kakas, and the word doers is ergates. Paul is saying that they're evil, they're worthless, they're depraved. They thought they're working righteousness, he says, but they're evil doers. They're evil workers. And finally, Paul says, be looking out for those who mutilate the flesh. The word mutilate here, katatome. And there's a pun here in the Greek which is not seen in English because the word circumcision is the word paratome. Paratome means to cut around. And in verse 2, he uses katatome, which means to mutilate. Okay? You get the power of what he's saying here. All right? I mean, when you see what's happening here, it's pretty strong language. Paul's saying, we are the paratome, they are the katatome. Paul is telling them that what they were doing was physically mutilating their bodies. There's no spiritual significance to it, he's telling them. You Jews think you're the circumcision, but in fact, you're the mutilated. That's what you are. Now, this word katatome was used in the Septuagint of the pagan cuttings of the body that were forbidden by Israel. Paul uses strong language when confronting the Judaizers. Look what he says in Galatians. He says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. And the word emasculate here is apocopto, and it means castrate, amputate, cut off. Paul says, I wish you Judaizers would just go all the way and cut it off. Strong language, okay? Because they're counting on the circumcision as a badge to them that they're okay. They're the people of God. He said, just cut it off, all right? 
And people, those who add works to salvation are dangerous. They're dangerous then. They're dangerous now. They're dogs. They're evil workers. They're mutilators. Paul preached grace, salvation by faith alone. Then along comes these Judaizers and say, yeah, you've got to trust Christ, but you also, and that's the church today, yes, that's true, you've got to have faith, but you also have to do, do, do. Many Christians buy into this system, and it's just confusing the church. Well, this morning I want to focus on the theological significance of Paul's description of the church as the circumcision. All right? He says, we are the circumcision. Now, the we here is a reference to Paul and the Philippian Christians. But what Paul says to them is true of all Christians. Theologically, this is really significant. This is Paul's description of the church of Christ. The church, he says, is the circumcision. There's a definite article before that. And if you have the New American Standard, it says we are the true circumcision. Now, the word true is not in the text, but they're trying to help you out. Okay? But the definite article does enough. We're the circumcision. All right? That's who they are. Circumcision had a great significance in the Old Covenant Israel. Genesis 17 teaches us that circumcision was given as a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Exodus 12, we see it was carried over into the Mosaic covenant. And as it developed down through the history of Israel, and even in the time of our Lord, it became very clear that the circumcision is a title. The circumcision is a technical designation for the children of Israel. That's why this is so significant here. Paul says, no, we're the circumcision. That's really important here. There are many passages in Acts and in some of Paul's letters which instead of saying Israel, instead of saying the Jews, they're simply called the circumcision. Okay? Acts 10.45. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. So the Jews here are called the circumcised. And they're astonished because they see the Gentiles getting the Holy Spirit. Acts 11, 2 and 3. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So the Jews here are the circumcised party. They're criticizing because he went with uncircumcised. That's a designation for the Gentiles. Romans 3, 30. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Okay, you got the Jews, you got the Gentiles, both being saved by faith. Galatians 2, 8 and 9. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, okay, Peter's going to the Jews, worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and to me, that we should go to the Gentile and they to the circumcised. Again, it's clearly a designation for the Jews. I'll go to the Gentiles, you go to the Jews. All right, that's what he's talking about here. Ephesians 2.11. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision. That's what they called the Gentiles because they weren't circumcised. By what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. All right, so you got Jews, Gentiles. This is a technical designation. Colossians 4, 10 through 11. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. So again, the term, the circumcision, a, design, a technical designation for Israel. So Paul is taking this technical designation that's always used for Israel, and he says, we are the circumcision. Now, I think that's why the New American Standard added, added true there to make you understand, oh, they're not the truth. We're the true circumcision. We are it. We're the true ones. All right? Very, very significant here. He says, you Jews are no longer the circumcision. They're, in fact, the mutilators. Okay? They're the destroyers. Who then is the circumcision? Well, Paul says, it's those who worship by the Spirit of God, 
glory in Christ Yeshua and put no confidence in the flesh. Does that describe a Jew? Could it describe a Jew? No. Are they going to glory in Christ? No, they hate Christ. Are they going to put no confidence in the flesh? All their confidence was in the flesh. That's where all their confidence was. So he's saying this is, this is a, de- a description, people, of the church. Christians, true believers. The church, he said, is the true circumcision, the true Israel, the true Jew. Now, I would say that probably most Christians today believe that a Jew is someone who descended physically from Abraham and as a sign of his covenant relationship with God had the mark of circumcision. But Paul seems to be telling us that the circumcision is not determined by ethnic derivation, not determined by the blood flowing in your veins, but rather the faith that's in your heart. It's a matter of circumcision of the heart. Now, the majority of the nation Israel rejected Christ at His first advent. He was accepted by the little flock, the disciples and others, They were what constituted the believing believing remnant and the unbelieving nation as a whole. And throughout the Tanakh, even in times of extreme unbelief, there was always a remnant. God always had a people. Remember Elijah thought he was all alone and he was whining, God, I'm the only one left. Can you imagine being thinking, I'm just it? I'm the only one? (laughs) Romans 11, 3 and 4, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. I alone am left. I'm it. It's just me, Lord. And they seek my life. But what's God's reply to him? God says, I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God always has a remnant. And at the time of Israel's national rejection of the Messiah, there was still a remnant who put their trust in Yeshua. The little flock that accepted him were the believing remnant within the unbelieving nation. And we looked at this last week. We focused on this. This is such an important verse. It's not as though the Word of God failed, okay? Because they're saying, well, God, what about all these promises you made to your people? Well, they, the, the people were not Israelis. They were true believers. That's who the promises were for. He says, for not all who descended from Israel, that's physical Israel, belong to Israel. Let me see if I can demonstrate this in a graphic to you, okay? National Physical Israel, okay, the people of God. You're born into that, you're circumcised into that, you're part of that. Within that nation, there was true Israel. Those who trusted God, those who lived for God. They weren't just born into this family, they really wanted to serve Yahweh, okay? And as the Lord, when the Lord came, true Israel trusted Christ, and then the gospel went out to everybody else, and it became the church. All who trusted Him became part of that true Israel. National Israel's done. It's gone. It's done away. God's finished with those people. It's just the church now, which is true Israel. The true Israel of God. Look what Yeshua said here, talking to Jews. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Other sheep? I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there'll be one flock and one shepherd. So I got other sheep, but we're going to make one flock. It's made up of Jews and Gentiles who form one body, the true people of God. Yeshua saw the realization of Israel's true destiny in the circle of His disciples. They're not a new Israel. They're not a different body, but the true Israel, the believing remnant. In Matthew 16, 18 through 19, Yeshua says, I tell you, you're Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yeshua here is not prophesying some completely different body of believers cut off from old covenant Israel. He is prophesying, he is speaking here about the church. And who made up the church? Well, Jews made up the nucleus of the church, okay? Okay. They played a very important function in redemptive history. For the first 10 years, it was only Jews in the church. How did God spread them? How did God finally convince them to go to other people? Persecution. He drove them out. Go and tell other people about it. But yet you got John Hagee saying, they don't need the gospel. Well, then Yeshua really messed up. 
Because he spent his whole life preaching to nobody but Jews. Every one of his disciples were Jews. He preached all around Judaism. That's what he was, that was his message. And then the church for 10 years after that stayed there preaching the gospel until they finally got driven out. But Hagee says, oh, they don't need, they don't, that's the Zionists. They don't need the gospel. Why did he get it in the first place then? You know, they just, they have their own promise that's something different. Listen, the disciples who made up the nucleus of the emerging church stand in direct continuity with Old Covenant Israel. That's what we have to understand. We're not separate from them. We're connected to them. <clears throat> we don't, we're not to think of the church, as dispensationalism does, as a temporary interruption in God's prophetic purpose for Israel. That's what, that's what dispensationalism teaches. God's working with Israel, and then they, they didn't believe Him, so He said, whoa, stop, time out. Stop the clock. Stop it. Okay. Let me go to the church for a while. I'll come back to Israel later. Okay, so the clock's not moving right now. So that's why when he said soon, it could be soon, but the clock stopped. All right? We're in intermission here. The church is not an interruption, okay? The church is not some new, entirely different or distinct covenant body of people. The church is the believing remnant of Israel. Coming, they're maturing and coming to faith in Christ. You know, if you're familiar with dispensational theology, you know that it teaches the primary teaching of dispensationalism is God has two peoples, Israel and the church. Two destinies. Israel gets to live on earth. Christians get to go to heaven. Two covenants, two pro They're se totally separate. But this is not what the Bible teaches, Okay. As we just showed you, you know, Paul's really stressing, you know, we're the circumcision, okay? The church is not separate and distinct entity from Israel. We are the Israel of God. And Philippians 3.3 doesn't stand in isolation in the New Testament. You know, that's not the only time Paul did this. He did it all through the New Testament, trying to stress that the believers were now the Israel of God. Look at Romans 11, 17 through 20. If some of the branches were broken off, that's speaking of Israelites, Okay, because they're unbelievers, they're broken off. And you, although a wild olive shoot, now this is contrary to nature, you don't, you don't graft a wild olive shoot into a cultivated tree, you do the opposite, all right? But this, this is how God works, all right? You're a wild olive shoot, you are grafted in among others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Don't be arrogant toward the branches, the, the Israelites. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root. The root supports you. It says, then you will say, branches were broken off, so I might be grafted in. That is true. They're broken off because of their unbelief. Unbelieving Israelites, part of the nation Israel. But you stand fast through faith. Do not become proud, but fear. So the Gentiles are grafted in with them, with the believing Israelites, and they partake of the root of the olive tree. Now, there's different views on what this root is. I believe the root is Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant. That is what we're grafted into, okay? Paul taught the Gentiles in the church shared the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant through Christ. So we're grafted in. Their promises become our promises. Because now we're part of that root system. Ephesians 2.11 Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision. All right, the Gentiles again are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. The Jews are calling you that, uncircumcised, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Now I want to focus here at that time. That's talking about before Christ's advent, before Christ came and began His ministry, the Gentiles were, and the only way they could get to God was through Israel. They had to come, be proselytes, come through Israel, that is it. They, Israel had it all. They had the covenants, the promises, the fathers, they were all theirs. And He tells them, you were separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's where Gentiles were prior to Christ's coming. Then in 2.13, he says, But now, in Christ Yeshua, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You're brought near. Brought near to what? Brought near to the commonwealth of Israel. Brought near to the covenants, the promises that God made them. 
Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down the flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. God made the two one. One new man in place of the two. There's no Jew. There's no Greek. We're one in Christ. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. 219. So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens. That's us Gentiles. We're no longer strangers. But we're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Amen. Believing Gentiles have been admitted as citizens into the commonwealth of Israel. We partake of their promises. We partake of their blessings in Christ. We looked at this last week, Galatians 3.16. If you don't know this verse you got to mark this. you got to memorize this first. It's so clear what he's saying here. Paul says the promises were to Abraham and his offspring. Not every physical offspring, because he says it doesn't say to offsprings referring to many. It's not plural. It's singular. But referring to one, your offspring, who's Christ. So the promise is to Abraham and Christ. So how do we get in on it? By faith in Christ. If you by faith belong to Christ, you are Abraham's offsprings. And guess what? You're heir to the promises. And it doesn't matter whose blood you have in your veins, it's whose faith you have in your heart, because it's covenant, not race, that makes you a Jew. Listen, this is in Paul's day. Paul's saying it's covenant, not race. Well, there's no race today, so race is certainly not a factor today. But most Christians still consider the Jewish people as a race. You agree with that? Most of them. But there is no Jewish race today. That's provable, okay? After the destruction of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel after the flesh was scattered throughout the earth, and they lost all tribal relations, okay? And the scattering made immutable, was made immutable due to the fact that all the tribal genealogical records were destroyed with the temple. And the simple fact is, there's no existing Jewish race. There's no way to trace their bloodline and say, look, I'm, I'm a child of Levi. Look, I come from, you know, Jacob. No, they can't do that. The Encyclopedia Britannica, 1973, it probably wouldn't say this anymore, but said it then. It talked, the title was Jews as a Race. The findings of physical anthropology show that contrary to popular view, there is no Jewish race. Anthropornetic measurements of Jewish groups in many parts of the world indicate that they differ greatly from one another with respect to all the important physical characteristics. Now, in a paper posted on PubMed, okay, it's a government site, PubMed, they they publish all kinds of uh, studies, medical studies, mostly it's publications, medical stuff, okay, for the most part. But there is an article posted on PubMed um, entitled, Out of Kazaria, Evidence of Jewish Genome Lacking. It says this, Aaron Elkike, who's a geneticist at John Hopkins School of Public Health, in a recently published study in Genome Biology Evolution, is calling for a rewrite of commonly held assumptions about Jewish ancestry. Instead of being primarily the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel, present-day Jewish populations are, finds Elkike, primarily the children of a Turkish people who lived in what is now Russia, north of Georgia, east of Ukraine. This civilization, the Khazars, converted to tribal religion, from tribal religions to Judaism between the 7th and 9th centuries. Okay, so he says, look, the people that are calling themselves Jews, no, they don't come from there, all right? They're not Middle Eastern people. They come from the Khazars. The Khazars, they converted in mass numbers to Jude. Okay, I'm a Jew now. They're not Mosaic followers. They're not followers of the Mosaic law, so they're not really religious Jews. They're, not, they're nothing. They just call themselves Jews. You can just do it. Sammy Davis Jr. was a Jew, he said. Okay? Anybody can just say they're a Jew. You can just, I'll, I'll be a Jew. I'll convert. Don't know anything about the Bible, but I'll convert. Now, Shalomo Sand, who was a history professor at Tel Aviv University and the author of the controversial book, 
the invention of the Jewish people. He says Elhike's paper was a vindication of a long-held belief of his. Okay, A lot of flack for that book. Sand says this, it's so obvious to me, some people, historians and even scientists, turn a blind eye to the truth. No. Scientists turn a blind eye? It's not follow the science, it's follow the money, okay? Once to say Jews was a race was anti-Semitic. Now to say they're not a race is anti-Semitic. He says it's crazy how history plays with us. In another article entitled Ashkenazic Jews, Mystery Origins Unraveled by Scientists, Thanks to Ancient DNA by Aaron Elkike. Again, this is published on fizz.org. He says, for a more scientific take on the Jewish origin debate, recent DNA analysis of Ashkenazic Jews, a Jewish ethnic group, revealed that their, material, their maternal line is European. It has also been found that their DNA only has 3% ancient ancestry, which links them with Eastern Mediterranean, also known as the Middle East, namely Israel, Lebanon, parts of Syria, Western Jordan. This is the part of the world Jewish people are said to have <clears throat> originally come from, according to the Old Testament. But 3% is a minuscule amount and similar to what modern Europeans as a whole share with Neanderthals. So he's saying it's just about non-existence their DNA connection to Semites, okay? They, they don't have a connection. That's what he's trying to tell people. There's no connection there, okay? Now, this is modern stuff that they're putting out now. They're just saying, no, that those people don't belong there. So given that the genetic ancestry link is so low, Ashkenazi Jews' most recent ancestors must be from elsewhere. <laughs> okay, they, they just, they got to be coming from somewhere else because they're not from Israel, all right? Now, most people blow fuse over this stuff. This is, you know, do the research. I, I got all the links in there for all these articles. You can go on PubMed, you can go on fizz.org. You can look these things up. <clears throat> but here's what we have to understand, believers. Those who trust in Christ are now the people of God, the only people of God. The Bible teaches that if you're in Christ, you're a true spiritual Jew. In 1 Peter and in James 1.1, <clears throat> the designation, the dispersion, is used for the church. Well, that also was a technical designation of Israel. And look what Peter says. He says, uh, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter is writing here to believers, to the church, and all these terms are taken right out of the Tanakh. They're technical designations for the covenant people of Israel. And Peter is saying... Just like Paul did, you believers are now the covenant people of God. Believers. Revelation 1.6 And made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Who's the us here? It's believers. All believers. This phrase comes from Exodus 19.6 and is used when God on Mount Sinai constituted Israel as his theocratic community. The terms which God gave to Israel are now applied to the church over and over and over throughout the New Testament. And that's what Paul is trying to tell us. We are the circumcision. <clears throat> now someone is going to say, are you trying to redefine what constitutes a Jew? No, Paul did. Paul did it, okay? How about Romans 2, 28 and 29? You ever read this verse? How'd you like to be a Jew reading this verse in the first century? No one is a Jew who's one merely outwardly. What? How else do you get to be one? I mean, I was born with this. It's, yes, it's physical. It's my descent. Nor is circumcision outward in... What? That's all circumcision is, is outward. It's a physical thing, okay? It's a surgery. But Paul says, okay, that, you're not a Jew outwardly and circumcision isn't outward. Things change. Christ came, all right? He says, but a Jew is one inwardly. Oh, now it's a matter of the heart. And he says, circumcision is a matter of the heart. What? No more knife? We don't need to be cut any? No, it's a matter of your heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. See, being a true Jew has nothing anymore to do with ethnic background. 
It has to do with being in a covenant relationship with God by faith, which comes from trusting in Christ. James Perloff writes, Until 50 years ago, most Christians accepted events recorded in the book of Joshua as something special for that particular time. Now, he's talking here about the conquest. And I, you know, I push people to read their Bibles. Read through your Bible every year. Read through your Bible every year. Once someone does do that, they're shocked because God's killing everybody. Okay, what's going on here? Why is everybody? Kill the babies, kill the children, kill the kill everything. Listen, during the conquest, what's going on? They're wiping out the Nephilim. They got to wipe out this race. They're killing it off. Okay. So he says, people kind of understood that. We believe the coming of the Savior, he says, brought a new covenant under which we no longer resort to violence. We agree, right? He says, to advance the king, we don't count on violence to advance the kingdom of God. In other words, we're not grabbing our rifles and going out and saying, become, become a Christian, trust Christ, we'll kill you. All right? But when the Zionist movement began in Palestine around 1920, some Christians started to disregard New Testament principles. We would say it's wrong for us to kill our neighbor and to steal his property. Everybody agree with that? Think it's wrong to kill your neighbor, steal their property? Watch what he says, people. This is powerful. He says, but if Jewish people did it in Palestine, it's okay. They're still saying that. Oh, it's okay. He says, first it was thousands then tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were driven from their homes. All of their property was stolen by the Zionists. Forty percent of the victims were professing Christians, many of whom were born-again believers. Yet, to our everlasting shame, many Christians in America have stood on the sidelines and cheered for the murderers. It's okay, we say, because Zionism is a fulfillment of prophecy. It's hard to imagine how any Bible believer with reasonable intelligence could endorse such things, particularly when so many thousands of conscientious Jews the world over have objected strenuously to Zionist aggression in Palestine. That's what's going on today. They're cheering. Go in there and kill them. Wipe out those Palestinians. And that's what they're trying to do. They've cut their water off. They cut off their power. And these people, and they're just going, bombing, and and killing. And the reason they haven't wiped them out yet is they don't have the world's approval behind them. Okay? And once they get that, I don't know that they will now. That was their intent, I think. Well, James Pirloff, in an article on Christian Zionism, writes this. Contrary to the Zionist media spin, Israel is the world's number one sponsor of terrorism. I don't know if that shocks you, but people, let me tell you something. It's true. I had a guy at the gym on Friday come up to me and he said, hey, um, why do you think there's so much anti-Semitism now? I unloaded on him. He says, he just shook his head. He's sitting there just shaking his head. He goes, I should know better than to ask you a question. (laughs) But I told him, you know, he's like, what, what, what? Israel is the number, the world's number one sponsor of terrorism. We got to understand that, people. Implemented by the way of deception. Now, that's the motto of Mossad, by way of deception. In other words, we don't make it outright. we got to deceive the people. That's Mossad is Israel's intelligence service. This has included, for example, the 1946 King David Hotel bombing. I think that's been made so evident now. There's not much question about that. 1954 Levon Affair. The vicious 1967 attack on the USS Liberty. You all remember that? The 1986 Trojan deception that led Reagan to bomb Libya. And of course, the mother of them all, 9-11, covered with Zionist Israel fingerprints. 9-11 led to the countless and unnecessary Middle East wars, which were already foreknown in 2001. Those wars, in turn, produced a refugee crisis ravaging Europe today. Think of what happened at 9-11, people. The people were not about war. They were not in favor of going to war. 9-11 happens. Oh, the the Arabs did that. Oh, let's go get them. You know, Toby Keith comes out with a song. We'll put a boot in their butt, you know, and let's go get them, people. Let me ask you something. 
Whose enemies were those people that we were attacking? Those are Israel's enemies. There is, and see, Israel's using us to wipe out their enemies, okay? Those people weren't bothering us. Those people had nothing to do with 9-11, all right? But it worked, a false flag, it worked, and the American people got behind it. That's why I say Christian Zionism is blasphemy, people. It is blasphemy, all right? And it's just, it's idol worship. We're worshiping these people who have nothing to do with our God. It is illegal to share the gospel in Israel. But we're supporting them. We're all about them. They don't believe in our Bible. They hold to the Talmud which say that Jesus is boiling in excrement in hell. That's what the Talmud says, okay? People, Christians have no theological stake whatsoever in the modern state of Israel. None. Religious Israelites are anti-God because they're anti-Christ. And Judaism is a cult. And unless they turn to Christ, they will perish. Look at what John wrote about the Christ-rejecting Jews of his day. Revelation 3.9. Behold, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews and are not. Now, who says they're Jews but aren't? Would a Gentile say, I'm a Jew? No. This is talking about physical Israel. Physical Israel, we're Jews. And he goes, not anymore. The unbelieving Jew, he says, you're of the synagogue of Satan. And then he does something really interesting here. Yeshua, the rest of the verse, is quoting from Isaiah 60. Let's go back and look at Isaiah 60. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you. <clears throat> those who persecute you, those who afflict you, they come and bow to you. And all who despise you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of of Yahweh, the Zion, the Holy One of Israel. Now, <clears throat> if you're an Old Covenant Jew, you're going to understand this prophecy of Isaiah as the, your Gentile enemies being subservient to you. But Yeshua takes this verse and He turns it around and He applies it to the church, true Israel, and it's Old Covenant Israel that is persecuting them. And Yeshua said that Old Covenant Jews are going to come and bow down before the feet of the church, the Israel of God. Turns it right on its head. A true Jew, a true Israelite is one who has trusted in Christ and been circumcised in heart. And those who are the Israelites of God's prophetic purpose are not those who are Jews ethically or outwardly. It's those who trust Christ and only those who trust Christ. Look at Galatians 6, 14 through 16. But far be it for me to boast, okay, that's the song this morning. I will not boast in anything. There's nothing we can boast in, people, except, Paul says, I'll boast in this, the cross of our Lord Yeshua the Christ. That's what we can boast in. By which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So Paul, see, Paul here is saying, listen, people, circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision, that doesn't matter. That's not important anymore. Things have changed since Christ came. We are saved only as we trust in Christ. And when we become part of Christ, we're a new creation. Now, he says, a new creation, that's all that matters. Well, how do you get to be a new creation? Well, Paul told us in Corinthians, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, this is talking about people, this is talking about our position, okay? This is so important to understand. Anybody ever struggle with this verse as a new Christian? Yeah, I used to read this and I'd shake my head. It's like, what? The old has passed away. Behold, it's all, no, it's not all new. I'm still doing a lot of the old junk. You know, I struggle until I realize this is not talking about how I act. It's not talking about my practice. It's talking about my position. I'm in Christ. I'm a new creation in Christ. Now it's time for me to start living up to it. But man, this verse will cause a lot of people to stumble. I must not be a Christian because everything's not new for me, right? And as for all who walk by this rule, Peace and mercy upon them and the Israel of God. He calls the believers, Jews, Gentiles there, he calls them the Israel of God. 
And this is summarizing his whole argument. You know, we saw in, in chapter 3, he talked about Abraham. We're partakers of the Abrahamic covenant. In chapter 4, he talks about, you know, ca cast out the bound woman and her son. And he's just, he's just pulling it all together here saying, listen, you're the Israel of God. The false teachers were claiming that only those who follow the law belong to Israel. And Paul proclaims that all those who follow the gospel are the true Israel of God. We believers are the Israel of God by faith in Christ Yeshua. Amen. People, the church is not a temporary interruption in God's prophetic program for Israel. Okay? The church is the prophetic fulfillment of that program because the church is Israel. Covenant. Not race has always been the defining mark of the true Israel of God. So when Paul says, we are the circumcision, in context, he's teaching that the fleshly accomplishments don't matter to God. Race doesn't matter to God. True circumcision is of the heart. The Jew, I mean, the Christian is the one who is the true Jew, who is the true Israel. Only in faith in Christ. The true believer worships by the Spirit of God. They rejoice in Christ, Yeshua, and they put no confidence in the flesh. Again, no, this is not describing a Jew, okay? A physical, racial Jew. They don't glory in Christ. They, they put all their confidence in the flesh. It's all about what they've done, and it's about their lineage and their heritage and all that. Those in Israel who call themselves Jews, or again, those anywhere who call themselves Jews or Israelites, they're not. They're not religious Jews because they're not following the Mosaic Law. They're not ethnic Jews because that's been clear. Those people are done. They're gone. They're Christ-rejecting God-haters. That makes Zionists mad, okay? Zionist Christians really mad, okay? But look what John said. Who's a liar? The one who denies Yeshua the Christ. <laughs> The Jews deny Yeshua is the Christ? Do they deny it? Absolutely. They're liars. He said, this is the Antichrist. Tell, the, tell your Zionist neighbor that the Jews are the Antichrist. See how that goes over, okay? But that's what the Bible says, okay? They're Christ-rejecting God-haters. And yet Christians want to support them, want to stand behind them. All those today who call themselves Jews and deny Christ are antichrist. They are not the people of God. They are God's enemies. So people, with all that's going on and everything we're seeing, and listen, don't believe a word. You shouldn't be watching the mainstream media in the first place, okay? Because that's all they do how to do is lie. That's it, okay? And you're going to get a bunch of, you know, oh, they blew up a hospital. Did you hear that story? Did they? Nope. Where'd the bomb go? In the parking lot. And guess whose bomb it was? Hamas's. <laughs> but the mainstream media turns, they bombed the hospitals, nothing left. They killed thousands of children. Liars. They don't exaggerate, they just make stuff up. Okay? They just flat make stuff up. So don't, don't listen to any of that stuff, okay? Listen, I'm not for war at all over there. I, it's just sad. It's a mess. But this is the deep state involved in this, carrying out their thing. You're trying to get their thing accomplished, and they want you on the side of Israel so Israel can take our money, our weapons, our military, and go over there and die for their causes. God help us. God help our leaders that they have enough sense to not send our young men over there to be mutilated and killed for Israel's causes. All right? Now, we just touched the surface here, okay, basically. So if you want to get into further study on this, you want to dig a little deeper, I would recommend uh, my friend Mike Sullivan's book, Armageddon Deception. It's like 450 pages, okay? Uh, he goes into great detail. He spent thousands and thousands of hours preparing this book. So, And, and here's, here's the good news. You can't go on Amazon and buy it because Amazon took it down. So that tells you it's a good book because Amazon took it down. So what you have to do is you have to go to Mike's website, fullpreterism.com. That's where you can get the book. You go there and you click on the link for the store, and you'll find the book there, and you can get Mike's book. Um, he'd appreciate that. I, again, it's not light reading, okay, but it is very detailed. So if you want to really hone down on this whole subject, which 
I recommend you do because it's, it's pretty important that we understand this and stop being deceived. Another good book I would recommend is my friend T.J. Smith. He, T.J. was just here a couple months ago. He just recently published this, The Last Semite, and goes into detail too. It's not near, it's like maybe a quarter of Mike's book as far as size goes, you know, but it's good stuff. Um, so if you want more, that's where you go to get some more understanding in this stuff. You want to really want to, and I know a lot of you are that way. You just want to really drill down. Let me just say last week I was really encouraged by the amount of people who asked me for a link to the study I published about Jewish DNA. That's encouraging, okay? And, you know, and I'm telling people, well, the link will be in the text when I get the text out. <laughs> and that usually takes a little while to get the text up, but the links will be in the text. If you need them before, you can just email me or you can text, don't email me, text me, and I'll, I'll get them to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great love for us, Lord. Father, I, I pray for those people in Israel, in Palestine right now, undergoing war, Lord, in fear of their lives, parents, hearts torn out trying to protect their children, Lord. I can't even fathom. All for these evil people who lead these nations, Lord. God, I ask you to judge them, Father, these evil leaders. I pray that you would bring your wrath upon them. Deal with them, Father. Deal with them. Help us, Lord, to understand the truth of your word of God that we don't get sucked into these crazy ideas, Lord. And sucked into war. I pray for our leaders here in this country, Lord. I pray, Father, you'd raise up a few leaders with some courage, with some backbone to say no war, no more money to Israel. Oh, Lord, give us grace, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Amen. Okay, questions, <clears throat> comments? Stan? Um, I've seen, I think, last night on Telegram, uh, one of the few, well, one of the many I follow, but not all the time, and they were basically saying about Israel that Netanyahu, the Mossad, CIA, and all, they started all this, but there is going to be a civil war in Israel. Well, there's no doubt they started all this, you know. Again, they try to make it look like Hamas. But any, anybody who buys that doesn't know much about Israel and their technically advanced army and all, you know. Uh, I watched a couple of interviews from some IDF people, Israel Defense Forces. They were part of the IDF. They said, this is so far off base. They said, a cat cannot walk by that gate without everybody knowing what's going on. Mm -hmm. IDF forces were sent off to the West Bank that day so they were not around. And so Hamas just basically walked through the most mm -hmm. guarded gate in the world and slaughtered these people. Mm -hmm. I'm not buying it. Not at all. Not at all. Iron Dome wasn't working that day. Dog, I hate when that happens, you know? <laughs> but you understand that the, the Palestinians, and not the Palestinians, but um, Hamas, they're tearing up the plumbing in Gaza because they're taking the pipes to use for rocket launchers. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, what they're, this is what they're fighting with, okay? And Israel, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's really a joke. It's like you taking a rowboat up to a, you know, aircraft carrier and say, you're under attack! <laughs> you be laughing, yeah, okay. <laughs> Take one of the five-inch guns and swing it around and go, bye, rowboat. Gary? Well, your commentary there reminded me of a quote from or, that George C. Scott said in the movie Pat. It's your job, you start the troops, it's your job not to go out there and die for your country and get your enemy to die for his country. <laughs> so now Israel is getting us to die for them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And they, we've been doing their work for a long time. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Like I said, they, they own the media, they own the banks. Okay, that's so... Why that lady got fired. Yeah, that's exactly why that lady... David? I was sitting in my parents' room last night visiting with them. Of course, they're watch Fox religiously sitting there holding a piece for the most part. <laughs> yeah. but, but they were talking to a Israeli lieutenant, lieutenant colonel last night and um, I forget who the newscaster was but he was asking them questions one of which was you know well why has it been why is the ground assault not taking place yet and of course he went through the little whatever and one of the things he mentioned was you know there are some political issues 
that need to get straightened out first. And like you say, you know, without the approval of everybody else, they're not going to go in there and, and do whatever. And Iran is saying, you go in there, we're coming over right. there, okay? Oh, yeah. We're coming yeah, over they, there, too. So They sling a, Iran around like a yeah. red-headed stick. Right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and, of course, we just gave Iran, what, $6 billion? Well, we give everybody. Oh, okay, yeah, we're getting everybody money, okay? You know, I heard on a commercial the other night, someone, I can't remember the term that guys use, but they're saying that so many million, I think they said nine, six, nine million children in this country are... I forget the term they use, but they don't have enough food at the dinner table. Mm. Yeah. And I thought that is really bad if this mm. is true because how much money do we send to other countries? But mm -hmm. people in this country are starving. Can't believe they can't, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a crazy, and that's our money, people, okay? That's our money. People say, well, that's the government's money. <laughs> Where do you think the government gets their money from? They don't produce anything, they don't make anything, they steal it from us. They print it. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble now. <laughs> From Jan in Florida, she said, did, did Israel continue animal sacrifice after the first temple was destroyed and they were hauled off to Babylon? That's a good question, Jan. I don't know that they did. Uh, God, they were specifically told that they were to do their sacrifices in Jerusalem. All right. God says that the place when I, before the temple was, the tabernacle and temple were set, the place I put my name. So I, I don't know. That's a good question, Jan. Um, but I don't think they did. Okay. Uh, uh, Dana says, David, so true Israel was called the covenant people to bring Yahweh's name and glory to the other nations, thus making them one. So I like your diagram. It helped with the visual. Well, thanks, because I'm <laughs> cool, doing those visuals in PowerPoint. I'm like, that spends, you know, Bob spends like five hours. Don't you, Bob, on one slide? <laughs> <laughs> Got some great slides, but I can't do that. <laughs> Can you give a brief explanation of the hundred and forty-four thousand from the twelve tribes in Revelation? No, not really. <laughs> I never talked. I never taught through Revelation, and people want me to, but I'm like, you know, I want to teach stuff that's a little more practical. Okay, I don't care who. You know, I mean, I know I shouldn't say that, but I mean, when do you do that? There, huh? <laughs> I don't. I haven't taught through Revelation, so I couldn't give you an intelligent answer. I got my ideas, but you know, people ask me questions all the time. They write me Bible questions. I said, "Listen, here's the key. If it, if I did it, if I taught it, it's on the website. If I didn't teach it, I don't have an answer. Not an intelligent one, anyway. Okay? Because <laughs> if I haven't studied it, I mean, I have some views on this, but usually when I study it, I find my views are way off base. So I'd rather go look up something I did study." And get the answer there, or go to somebody else, because I, you know, like I said, if I didn't study it, I don't think I have the answer to it. JP from Oregon. Hey, JP, good to have you with us. Great sermon, Pastor Dave. I had first heard about this meme from one of your sermons. Oh, okay, he put the meme up. Of uh, It's got Yeshua sitting on thing, the people standing around him listening, and the people are saying, um, so what you're warning us about is not for us. Yeah. <laughs> and Yeshua goes, of course not. It's for people 2,000 years from now. That's how most people look at it, you know. Oh, I'm telling you this stuff, but don't worry. It's really not for you. <laughs> I had to save. It always gets a laugh, and so I figured I'd share it. If dispensationalists would see that there are no physical, fleshly Jews today, it completely shatters their paradigm. It does that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for standing firm on God's Word. It truly is sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Appreciate you watching. Uh, I don't know who this is from. I heard you refer to Sammy Davis Jr. being a converted Jew before. Mm -hmm. I doubt your younger listeners <laughs> know yeah. who Sammy Davis Jr. was. <laughs> 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 the first thought I had was you're telling your age. Okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. He's... <laughs> Never mind. If you don't know, Google him. <laughs> Google Sammy Davis Jr. You'll right find out. <laughs> He says, perhaps change that example to Marilyn Monroe. Would they know her? No, that's still back there. She was a converted. She's more well known. She might be more well known. She was a. Ask those young people on the front row. Do you know who Marilyn Monroe is? Do you know who Sammy Davis Jr. is? She was a. She was a converted Jew, and everyone knows who she was. Well, I don't know, or Ivanka Trump. Trump. Yeah, Either example, converted <laughs> Jew. Yeah. 
I had somebody write me this week and said, you're based. I'm like, okay, okay, go to, I'm like, I don't know what that means, but I had to look it up, and it was good, I guess. They're trying to say it was good. I forget what it even meant, but it was like, you stand out, you, you say what you mean, you you know, you back it. I, I was just like, I'm based. Uh, when I read that, I thought you meant bias, but that, that, no, I guess he is sounding yeah. positive. Is it B-A-S-T-E? No, it's like B-A-S-T-E. All right, uh, John Mooney says, thank you, Pastor David Glory. That Israel is now the church. There is the prophecy now fulfilled in Christ that the true Israel will be called a new name and the mouth of the Lord will utter. And yes, Christ is the one who uttered it. Amen. I mean, again, the scriptures are so clear when you... Understand your eyes are open. You understand what you're looking for. Uh, someone says on the subject of Jewish origin, it's thought that the Palestinians are more Jewish than the Israelites living in Palestine. Absolutely, the Palestinians are Semites. Okay, they're Semites. So if you're against the, if you're against the Palestinians, you're anti-Semite. If you're against Israel, you're not anti-Semite because they're not Semites. That's so dumb. Oh, that's anti-Semitic. No, they have to be a Semite to be anti-Semitic. Okay, they're not. Likely been there since the time of Christ. Yes, many of them have been there for thousands of years, okay? There were still some, you know, remnants of his. Not everybody left that area, but for the most part, the Palestinians had moved in, taken over, and then they all got wiped out. Thank you for singing this song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, two times. <laughs> as good as the teaching was today, that was the message I needed to hear. Thanks, Jill. Appreciate that. Uh, I, I love that song. It's pretty powerful. Have you seen the propaganda commercials about how 70 million people have heard that Hitler was right? Then it says, we need to change this. Propaganda commercial to brainwash. I'll tell you, people, I don't know what I believe about the Holocaust anymore. I know the Jews love to, you know, garner pity. Oh, poor us. This is the whole thing with this war that started. Oh, Hamas, look what Hamas did. Poor us, feel bad for us, get behind us. So I don't know. I, I say to you over and over, they lie to us about everything. History, everything they lie to us about. Okay, so just, you know, be careful what you believe. Oh, man, this, I can't even do, this is like, I can't do books, okay? I don't have time to sit here and read all that. Another book. Thank you for speaking the truth, Pastor Day. By the scripture, by the scriptures, evangelical Zionists have created a different gospel and another Messiah. Yes, they have. It's become like a cult. It is not like a cult. It is a cult. Uh, the article in the Israeli newspaper Times of Israel on October 8, 2012, admits Hamas was founded by Netanyahu. I know, I told you that last week, okay? They are the ones that founded Hamas. They used it as a counterweight, and then it blew up in their face, and now, oh, we're in all these troubles. So, yeah, I, people, uh, uh, Hamas is the asset of the state of Israel. She's not happy with this? She's not pro-Israel, is she? Oh, brother, we got to talk to her. What we saw last week in the state of Israel was a false flag. I agree, carried out by the state of Israel using the assets of Hamas. Yeah, this is all stuff I said last week. I agree with you. Good morning, Dave. Thinking about your sermon on Sunday, I would like to know where you got your information. Wow. <laughs> this is where I got a lot of it, okay, from the Bible. Uh, other stuff, it's just, you know, what? you got to be really more specific than that so that I might be able to look it up. So if you can do about 40 hours of research, then I, you know, I mean... I just I don't even know how to answer this question because, I mean, if you give me a specific, where did you get this from, I can answer that. But I can't say, where did you get your information? I don't have time to put together everything, you know, that I researched and did. I just, you know, that's got to be more specific. If you ask about a study. Genetic stuff, maybe. Oh, yeah, if you're talking about genetic stuff, like I said, all the links will be in the notes when they come out. Um, you know, I, I try to keep the links in there so you can go and look up those studies. But you can go to PubMed, you can look that up. You can go to Phys.org and look that stuff up. You know, I put the links right in the slide. So, Gary? While you were talking, I looked up on my phone, uh, just Jew, Jewish, Jews as a race. 
and I didn't get anything you mentioned, but there were several articles that talked about them not being a race. Mm -hmm. So it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Well, it's getting more and more prominent now. Okay, here's the problem. They used to could lie to us, and you're like, what do you got? You're stuck with it. Now, they can't do that. Mm -hmm. They lie to us now, and within a couple of hours, it's out. Mm -hmm. Hey, these pictures they're showing you of Hamas, those are pic destroying Israel. Those are pictures from two years ago. And here's where they're from. Okay? That fast, we're getting it. If you know where to get it, okay? And I get most of my information from Telegram, from, you know, civilian reporters, people on there who are on the ground or are connected, giving, putting out information to try to keep you informed. You know, I mean, nowadays you can take a picture and you can say, where's this from? And, and the Internet will find where that picture came from. Yeah. So they're dumb putting these stupid things out <laughs> saying, this is what happened. No, it didn't. You know, they're killing babies. No, they're not. Beheading babies. No, burning babies. That's all lies. Mm -hmm. But it gets the people upset, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted. That's all they wanted. And most people are not going to research a thing. There you go. They're not going to look into it. They're just going to say, oh, Fox News said it. Let me tell you something. Fox News isn't any better than CNN in my mind, okay? Fox News is a farce. It's a big farce. They're, they're the, you know, we're the conservative arm to keep you thinking we're conservative, but we're not. We're going to fill you <laughs> full of lies, and you'll think they're truths. We'll throw a little bit in here and there, okay? Oh, my word. I saw something. Uh, <laughs> I can't say it. <laughs> I just remembered what it was. I can't say it. Not appropriate. Yeah. Mike? Uh, Mike Sullivan's book, yes. Again, Deception, is very well documented. So a lot of that information is in that book. Okay. Yeah. Very well documented. Like I said, 450 pages yeah. of a lot of information that will help you, you know, understand what's going on and why it's going on. Gary showed me the cover and I noticed he's got John Hagee on there. <laughs> <laughs> Whispering in his ear. Gary? Well, in light of another message where you stand against... 90% of the world. Uh, <laughs> where are we going to meet next week? <laughs> you know, so far, last week's message is still up. Wow. On YouTube. And well, there's a lot of positive wow. comments which, on it. You know, huh? A lot of positive <laughs> comments on it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. A lot of, you know, uh, which surprised me. Like I said, on Rumble, they'll stay. Rumble's, uh, you know, yeah. the, the, guy that, uh, the guy that owns Gab, the guy that created Gab, Andrew Torba, he took last week's message and put it on Gab, and then he took two clips from it and put those on separately, and then put a slide from it on. So he had four different posts mm -hmm. from last week's message. You know, <laughs> I mean, the word's getting out there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we have a lot to counter because most churches are waving the blue and white flag and preaching Zionism. Yeah. That spot where you were quoting from articles. Uh -huh. um, I think you should make those into like YouTube, Instagram shorts, and TikTok. Because those, those aren't really. He'll get right on that. Yeah, you're going to be talking Greek to him. What's the short? Look at him back to you. All right. These, wait, wait, these guys are laughing at you because they know that I know how to turn a computer on. <laughs> But as far as these, you know, memes and this and that, and I'm like, Bring Andrew over. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, put Andrew to work. <laughs> yeah, when that, whenever that gets done, it's somebody else doing it. Okay, David or Jeff or somebody I these, else. I made these short a while back on YouTube, so. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the shorts are good because if people look, oh, that's four minutes, I can listen to that. Because most of them. One minute. One minute? Most of them. I can't say anything in a minute. <laughs> I, I, I edited you know, to get it over a minute. <laughs> he took an hour and a half and edited it into a minute. Wow. You get it all, boom. Is Perfect for our world. Okay. Yeah, let's uh most people don't watch them. Let's uh come on down, let's close with a song. This we've had this song as the last one for weeks and we never get to it. I keep talking to you.